Well, this is a, a wonderful day. This is a day that we are setting aside for the bread and the cup and day of communion. And so what we're going to do is to depart this morning from our series in the book of Acts. And we're going to make our way this morning to First Peter. And in First Peter, we're going to see here in chapter 3, verse 18, one particular verse, just one, that is going to stand out and in a very significant way speak to our hearts regarding the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so for those of us that are physically present in this building, first, second services, and for the wide-ranging ministry that's occurring on live stream, I want to draw our attention now to what's here. But in order to be able to set this verse in context, what I want to be able to do now with you, for you, is to look at how this fits into verse 13 onwards, because this was a time period of, of, of suffering. The Roman Empire was erupting. Most likely, this was the time period of Nero. We know some of the stories of Nero, of course. Now, what you and I are going to find is that the suffering that was beginning to unfold in the midst of the political oppression of that time period, at this moment in history, was more sporadic uh, than continual. Furthermore, it was more regional than universal. But year by year, as emperors changed hands, what you will find is that there was an escalation of what was occurring in terms of the persecution and the oppression of the people of God. Now, what Peter is going to do is not only to speak to his time, but in essence to speak to all times with regard to how to be able to minister effectively when the days seem to be threatening. What I want to do is to read from verse 13, read it down through verse 18, but again, our focal point this morning is going to be verse 18. And here, you and I find these words. Now, is there, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you'll be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. Having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Here's your verse. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So this is the particular verse now that we're going to focus upon this morning as we see how it powerfully speaks to all peoples in all places of all times as we now pause and we look to our Lord in prayer. Now, Father, you are the sovereign God. You are the creator of all. You speak to each and every one at their point of need. And you know each and every need. For the growing live stream audience, Father, worshipers. For those that will be tracking even in the course of the coming days and weeks of this exposition. And that you would speak and that you would take the truth that is found here 
and apply it to the times in which we live. For those that are physically present in this building, Father, what we're asking in the various services is that your Holy Spirit be working powerfully. These are fluid times. Fluid times require flexible strategies. But the flexible strategies are rooted in the fixed truth of your word. Now, Father, what we're interested in right now is the fixed truth of your word. Scriptures inspired by you, God breathed, meant for us, meant for all. We want these moments to count. Words are important. Time is important. Warm these hearts. Engage these minds. And shape these wheels, Father. For once again, we've come here now to see Jesus and him only. We're praying these things now in, in Jesus' name. Amen. The story begins in 1939. It was the year, you know, that Germany invaded Poland. And a man by the name of Maximilian Kolbe was ministering just outside of that great city of Warsaw in Poland. Hard worker, lover of people, devoted to his Lord. He brought such an extraordinary sense of enthusiasm and encouragement as he would minister to one and to all. But you fast forward now, not one year, but two years. And now what you and I find at this point is that in 1941, the Nazi regime, which has invaded Poland, feels threatened by this man that you and I know as Kobe. And so what happens at this point? Well, the Nazis arrest Kobe and charge him with publishing unapproved literature, and they send him to Auschwitz, Auschwitz. And now this 47-year-old man, he is wondering how many more days he has to live. You know, despite the incredibly difficult, brutal conditions, rather than seeking his own welfare, he was interested in the welfare of others. And so he began then to minister to the prisoners. But something went wrong. A prisoner escaped. And so on one hot July morning, the angry soldiers lined up the prisoners there in Auschwitz. The fugitive has not been found, the commandant screamed. Ten of you will die for him in the starvation bunker. And now a sense of a tremor made its way throughout the ranks of all the prisoners. A few days in the bunker without food and water. You can imagine what that does to the body and psyche of the individual. The commandant, named Fritsch, walked up and down the rows of the prisoners, stopping before certain men, pointing at a particular number. He never took time, you see, to learn names. And then his assistant jotted down the number, saying that that was one of the ten. But as he reached the tenth man, a man began to express some kind of anguish, you see, at this particular point in time. The man had a wife, a man had children, a man had parents who were up in years, and a couple of the children were, were disabled and challenged in life. And he began to anguish and express it. And the tears began to flow. The ten were forced to remove their wooden shoes on Nazi tradition when you were about to be executed. When lo and behold, there was a commotion in the ranks. prisoner broke out of line and was calling out the name of the commandant. You don't do that, you see. You just don't do that. 
suicidal. Prisoners not permitted to leave ranks, let alone address a Nazi officer. And then the prisoners, one by one, looked, looked carefully and gasped. It was Maximilian Kobe. And Kobe walked forward, stood before the commandant, and said, I would like to die in place of one of the men you have condemned. What begins to unfold for us this morning is the drama of substitution. It's an amazing story of how in the most austere of situations, the most brutal of conditions, someone breaks rank and someone steps forward to offer himself as substitute. More to the story. But in the meantime, what we see here now is that one broke rank. As now the second member of the Godhead steps in out of eternity into history and via Bethlehem makes his way to Calvary. And now what I'm going to do with you this morning out of just one singular verse we're going to extract four significant phrases that have everything to do with Jesus Christ being your substitute, my substitute, the one who died on the cross to save us, you see, from our sins. Now, the first phrase that stands out that appears on the screen is the phrase, for Christ also suffered once for sins. Let's begin to unpack this. <coughs> Notice that it reads, for Christ. Now, that's the New Testament version of what the Older Testament would describe as Messiah. Now, what Peter is now announcing as a Jew to these people were in that time period known as Asia Mida, today referred to as Turkey, was that in the midst of the Roman Empire, we are going to talk now in the midst of this ongoing, increasing, intensifying sense of opposition and oppression via the Roman Empire and its political system. <coughs> We're going to talk about who matters most, not Caesar, but Christ. But furthermore, notice that it reads, for Christ also suffered. It does not merely read, for Christ suffered, does it? No. By the text penning the thoughts, for Christ also suffered, what you and I are now being told is that Jesus Christ entered into the field of suffering. Now the people are going to look each and every way and say, we are being given a model for how to handle times, difficult times, oppressive times. Uh, Peter has already prepped them for this. Because in 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse 6, he would state, in this you rejoice. Though now, not for all time, though now for a little while, it is necessary. You have been grieved by various trials. Fascinating. Because the Greek word there for various carries with it the idea of multicolored. In other words, they are coming on a wide range. It's an artist's term to describe the wide ranging effect of these trials upon the general population. And now Peter, fully engaged with what's happening in terms of current events, but also weaving in the extraordinary story, not of Caesar, but of Christ, he's offering them, he's offering you, he's offering me an opportunity to understand that not merely 
does it read, Christ suffered, but Christ also suffered. In other words, saying, as you have gone through difficult times, now look at the one who experienced suffering to the nth degree, Jesus Christ. He knows his readership, but he also knows his Savior. In other words, now, someone who is promised to die in your place and my place endured extraordinary sufferings for you and for me. Adoniram Judson, who ministered in Burma, he was incarcerated for seven years for sharing the gospel. And during this time, when he was thrown into Ava prison, for 17 months, he endured extraordinary, intense, difficult forms of mistreatment, leaving his body scarred by the time he was released. But then the rest of the story. Undaunted upon his release, he asked for permission to enter another province where he could co continue, where he could resume sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the provincial leader of the setting, the circumstances, the, the region he was in, simply denied the request, saying, my people are not fools enough to listen to anything you might say. But I fear they might be impressed by your scars. And then listen. Then listen to what you have to say. Hmm. Now lift it higher. You've got a scarred Savior on your hands. You've got a scarred Christ on your hands. And now he enters into the realm of human suffering. For Christ not merely suffered, Christ also suffered. In other words, he's linking the word also back, you see, to what he had written previously about fellow believers suffering. But read on, you're still in the first phrase, aren't you? For Christ also suffered once. Why is that so significant? The Greek word is hapax. This word was used repeatedly in the book of Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews, the emphasis is that Jesus made one complete final offering of himself for your sins and mine. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 27. And so important, so significant was that to the writer of Hebrews. Five times he would reiterate that Jesus Christ died once for our sins. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26, he's appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. In chapter 9, of verse 28, Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. In chapter 10 of verse 12, the sacrifice was for all time one sacrifice for sins. Chapter 10, verse 18, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin, nothing more needed. Throughout the Older Testament, the Israelites were accustomed to the ongoing perpetual sacrifice of the lambs. But all of those were simply indicators, pointers, direction signs, leading towards the ultimate Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. Theologians would put it this way. The Old Testament sacrifices were subjectively efficacious. But only Jesus Christ on the cross was objectively efficacious. <coughs> the older system was certainly prescribed by God. Substitutes were being made, but here's the limitation. 
They were animals. <coughs> no human. For as the writer puts it in Hebrews 10 verse 4, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So no. Here we have a situation on our hands. And Jesus Christ, a Jew, the Jews fully understanding the prescribed substitutionary principle involved in sacrifice, would have their eyes open to the fact that the ultimate lamb died in your place, my place, for our sins. Raymond Buck. Raymond Buck was ministering in Africa, a particular village in Africa. And after telling the people that Jesus had died as a sacrifice for the sins of all humankind, he heard a surprising story. For you see, one of the villagers was excited by what Buck was telling them and explained that he had spent his entire life trying to find the right sacrifice to please God. He had offered up animals of all kinds, anything else he thought might please God. But now this search was over. Jesus was the right sacrifice. And he had already, already been offered. <coughs> Somebody approaches you then, or you approach them, and they're grappling with this whole matter of Christianity. You've introduced them to Christian worldview thinking. You've created a plot line where God is the creator, answering the question of, how did I get here? You've answered the question of the fall, where some in our world are asking the question, what's gone wrong? Why are things the way they are? But you're inching them towards the cross of Jesus Christ on your, on your plot line, where people are asking the question, and how can, this, how can this be fixed, this world of ours, globally as well as my life individually? What can I do? And you smile. I appreciate the sincerity of your question, you say. But the question is not, what can you do? The question is, what has God done? Add an N-E to the D-O and shift it from self to God. And now you begin to minister effectively in a culture that doesn't understand the plot line and is terribly confused by the fragmentation of this world. We need to shift people's thinking from do to done because we live in a world of substitutes where people try to substitute themselves for God, such as was the temptation in the Garden of Eden. As we've noted in prior weeks in the book of Acts, the Athenians were trying to substitute false gods for the true God. And throughout the world, when it comes to false spirituality, people are trying to substitute their works for God's grace. Their emphasis is due. And the heavens cry out, done. And Peter now seizes this with that one Greek word, hapax. For Christ also suffered once for sins. For you see, not only was this done conclusively once, not repeatedly. But furthermore, this was done purposefully. He died for sins, you see. Now we've got the sum total of what this is all about in that first phrase. Conclusive, purposeful, connected, 
and Jesus modeling, but not merely as an example that we need to follow, but as a substitute in whom we need to trust. You've grasped it. You're on to your second phrase. The first was, for Christ also suffered once for sins. Does not merely say, for Christ also suffered for sins. For Christ also suffered once for sins. But now you're on to the second phrase, the righteous for the unrighteous. And now you allow for yourself to go to that Bethlehem story. How can it be that Jesus Christ could be viewed as the righteous one? But what you have to understand is that in eternity past, the Trinity had already put together the perfectly engineered plan for salvation. A plan that humanity should not substitute for where the second member of the Trinity would break into time via Bethlehem. And in order to be the perfect substitute, it would require two natures, 100% man, 100% God, therefore the God-man, because only God could pay the penalty for sins. Only man should pay the penalty for sins. Don't disconnect Christmas from Good Friday. Don't disconnect Good Friday from Easter Sunday. Don't disconnect the first coming from the second coming. In a highly disjointed, disconnected world that can't connect the dots, Believers are making the connections. The righteous. What this means then is that this is substitutionary because it reads the righteous for the unrighteous. The unrighteous? Astoundingly, it does not read the righteous for the righteous. Jesus didn't come along and say, I'm just going to die for those that are already acceptable before me. No. Can't find one. What it reads is that this is the righteous substituting himself for the unrighteous. But I want us to get this. The righteous, in that phrase, is singular. The unrighteous, in this phrase, is plural. It means all of us. Not some of us. Singular for the plural. And now we're beginning to ponder the significance of this story that is unfolding in front of our very eyes in the way in which God wants to be able to develop our thinking to understand still better the whole idea of substitution, which is what happened there at that moment in Auschwitz. Maximilian steps forward. You don't address a commandant, do you, in Auschwitz? It takes courage. It takes conviction. Here's with the idea that there's more to life than this life in order to be able to stand strong in the face of death. I'd like to die in place of the, one of the men you condemned. Commandant Fritsch stared at prisoner 16670. Why, snapped the commandant, Eyebrows raised. For you see, the prisoners had never heard the commandant carry on a conversation with a prisoner before. But the commandant had never faced such a prisoner before. I'm an old man, sir. Your regime does not respect my age. 
I would like to die in the place of one. And in whose place would you want to die? asked Fritsch. And now, Kobe takes his finger and points. That one. The prisoner that he was pointing at was the prisoner that Kobe had ministered to in the prison setting. And he had heard the story of the needs of that particular family that that man had shepherded. And he knew that that family needed this man to live. That one, he said. Fritz glanced at the prisoner. He'd never seen such a substitution before. He'd never heard such an offer before. But before he could even bat his eye, Kobe took off his wooden shoes as that prisoner put his back on. Kobe would be the substitute. Jesus Christ is the ultimate substitute. But you see, in the case of Kobe and that fellow prisoner, In Auschwitz, the reality is it was the unrighteous dying for the unrighteous. But it is a powerful illustration that leads us to the cross of Jesus Christ and the great hapax, the once and for all, where the righteous, singular, died for the unrighteous, plural, the great substitution. And in a culture of substitutes, where people try to substitute self for God, such as the temptation of the God of Eden, and in a world of substitutions, where false religions and false spiritualities try substituting good works for Christ's work, or the assumption of goodness of human nature in place of Christ's perfect human nature, God breaks in. And the second phrase stands out, the righteous, for the unrighteous. Which leads us to the third phrase, that he might bring us, you see, to God. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve did not pursue God. They tried to create separation. They wanted a gulf. They wanted the gap. God pursued them. God overcame the gulf. God addressed the gap. And the clothing they were offered was just simply an indicator of the ultimate where you would be covered by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Subjectively efficacious for them, but a leading pointer, indicator of the one who would cover for us objectively, not subjectively alone, dying in our place for our sins. We are now told that he might bring us to God that is purposeful, overcoming the separation Notice that it does not read that we might come to God. What this tells me then at this point is that not only are we bought, we are brought. We are not only bought by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we are brought by the one who shed his blood into the presence of the holiness of God. In other words, separation has now been addressed with reconciliation. He might bring us, you see, to God. 
and the effects of the Garden of Eden are reversed. It was a presidential campaign. Deschler, Ohio, famous. Because one of the candidates making a stop along the way spotted a 13-year-old girl who held up a sign that someone had dropped, held it up, and the sign read, quote, bring us together again, unquote. But what is fascinating is that the year was 1968. What that tells us is that throughout history, because of the fall of humanity, not only was there separation from God and the God, and there was separation of humanity within that God and Adam from Eve. There was separation from self in that God and Adam with self, a psychological breakdown, a theological breakdown with God, a sociological breakdown with humankind, a psychological breakdown with self even an ecological breakdown with the God in itself, where Adam would have to work the ground among the thistles and it would be painful. And for those that are trying to spiritualize the matter of the environment, what we've got to understand is the sequence by which God goes about addressing all issues holistically. As the world cries out, humanity cries out, bring us together again, but it starts with God. But what I want us to understand at this point in verse 18 in your third phrase, there is a longing to be brought back together, but the question is how and by whom? Not only are we bought, furthermore, we are brought, if you know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that he might bring us in the plural now. He's being consistent, unrighteous in the plural, us pertaining to the plural. Where? To each other? He's interested in more than addressing the fragmentation of the culture. He's interested in creating oneness with Christ. There's your third phrase that he might bring us, not to our senses, not merely to one another, but that he might bring us, you see, to God. Which leads us to the fourth phrase that preps you and preps me for, in the moments to come, receiving the bread and drinking the cup. Because fourthly, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, and now we drink that in. And Peter must be anticipating via the workings of the Holy Spirit how people would try to still substitute and offer an alternative to what took place on that cross. Having been put to death, why Islam tries to find a substitute for Jesus on the cross at the last moment. They can't imagine in Quran that a prophet would would be put to death by the name of Jesus. Peter anticipates this via the workings of the Holy Spirit. Not rescued from death, not saved from death, but to save us through his death, put to death. He addresses that in the flesh, which in the time period which Peter wrote, there were some esoteric philosophies floating as to whether or not Jesus was truly in the flesh. He addresses that. But I want you to see the B-U-T. It doesn't end there. Because after a good Friday, along comes an Easter Sunday morning. But, made alive again in the Spirit. Made alive again? Resurrection. In other words, not only do we find ourselves in a situation where Christians are looking for ways to validate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what God is doing is validating the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. 
But Jesus is saying, told you so. I told you that three days later I would be raised from the dead. He's credentialed at that point to enter into the presence of the holies, to intercede for you and for me, creating oneness in a world of brokenness. Made alive again in the spirit and say, Gary, in the spirit, what's meant by that? In the spiritual realm. As a former professor of mine, Dr. Wayne Grudem would put it, lasting, permanent, eternal. He's in the heavenlies, in the spiritual realm, waiting to come again. On August 14th of 41, they were amazed. They heard singing. The gods did. From Maximilian Kobe's cell, the starvation cell. Songs, prayers, joy. They were astounded. Zovas Haven, Vionigation. We never saw anything like it before, they said to one another in German. And then he died. But what about the one who lived? The one who was able to put his wooden shoes back on? The one who watched Maximilian walk by to the starvation cell? The one who died so that he could live? His name was Franz. He died in Poland in 1995, 53 years after Kobe had saved him. But he would never forget. Because shortly before he passed away, Franz went to Houston, Texas from Poland. He wanted to visit a particular church in Houston known as Maximilian Kobe Church. He went with his translator. And as he stood before the congregation, stooped because of age, the translator then, translating for Franz, said to the packed audience, Franz says, as long as I live, and as long as I have breath in my lungs, I want to tell everyone about my substitute. Which is our responsibility as well. As the worship team comes forward, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Thanking you, Father. You've given us pointers, indicators. The Maximilian Kobe's of this world, he an unrighteous one dying for the unrighteous one. But arresting our attention pertaining the righteous one who died for the unrighteous ones. The singular for the plural. And while this world is filled with substitutes for Jesus, You offered the perfect substitute for us. And while there are substitution plans for salvation that get floated in a culture and the world, from eternity past, you would design the perfect substitution plan, entering in this world via Bethlehem, two natures in one person, in order to be the perfect sacrifice to die in our place for our sins so that not only would we be bought by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, we would be brought by the one who shed blood to you. Thank you, Father.
for our substitute. We praise you in Jesus' name.